Hello, everyone. You're very welcome to today's postgraduate open day webinar uh, for MA Graphic Design Communication at Camberwell College of Arts. My name is James Carey. I work in the student recruitment marketing team and I coordinate this event. You'll hear a little from me at the beginning and I'll be available at the end for the Q&A. Please do ask questions throughout the session. I'll just give you a tiny bit of information about the technology. Um, your microphones are muted, your webcams are, are off, so you don't need to worry about those. You can't be seen or heard, but uh, do avail of the Q&A section and just ask questions as you go along. Um, I'm just going to introduce the panel before I present a few slides. Over to you. So, Sadna. <laughs> Hello, sorry, I was pressing buttons. Hello, my name is Sadna Jern and I'm the course leader of the MA Graphic Design Communication course, which is based at Camberwell. And it's a real pleasure to have you here today. I'll hand over to Nourisha, one of our students. Hello, everyone. I'm Nourisha, and I'm one of the students from Gamble College of Art studying MA Graphic Design Communication. Thank you. So I'm just going to cover a handful of things. It's probably more the sides of the application process, entry requirements, that kind of thing. And then Sadna will go through the course in much more detail. And obviously, then you have a student perspective from Narisha towards the end, and then Q&A at the end. Um, and as I said, any questions, just ask as you go. I'll be able to see them all. This slide might be very obvious for some of you, but just in case, uh, Campbellwell College of Arts is part of University of the Arts London, which is six colleges. Um, Campbellwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon Colleges of Art work together as kind of sister colleges. Um, and each of them are based in the locations, the clues in the name, so Campbellwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon. And then you've got London College of Communication at Elephant and Castle, London College of Fashion, which has moved to Stratford this year. It just opened up this year. Um, and Central St. Martins at King's Cross. So why UAL? Just a few uh, highlighted points for this. There's lots of information on our website. Um, and I do recommend following us on Instagram. Um, we'll give you all the information at the end for this, uh, just so you're more up to date on what it is we're doing. So UAL is the largest specialist arts university in Europe. And it's been number two in the top universities list for art and design for that specific subject area for the past five years in the QS university rankings. Um, when you join UAL, you join a creative community of 20,000 creatives. Uh, that's from foundation right through to PhD level across a whole range of subject areas. Um, and one of the things that's quite interesting for somebody who, let's say you do this course and join in Camberwell, you, your card does give you access to all of the six college sites. Um, not the course specialist areas in other courses, but it does give you access to the libraries, the canteens, the communal spaces. So that can be really interesting, especially if you're at postgraduate level, because um, there is a postgraduate community across the six colleges, which I'll talk a little about in a minute. Um, the London location is a key thing for UAL. Um, looking at Campbell specifically, um, you are pretty much attached to the South London Gallery. It's the building next door. Peckham itself has a really um, vibrant design and creative community, um, which, and we know a lot of the students live in that local area. They don't live that far from the camp campus. There is also accommodation right on the campus as well. Um, another benefit of uh, Campbell is that the staff, uh, technical staff, teaching staff, are practicing professionals in their own fields as well. Um, and by joining Campbell, you're joining a smaller campus within a larger university. So you have that smaller localized feeling as well as being part of a wider, bigger university as well. And you also avail of the industry links and progression into careers that UAL can offer. Camberwell itself, um, its ethos is to rethink current practices and cultivate new ones. There's a really strong uh, focus on traditional craftsmanship and digital technology. Um, which can be seen in the studio culture. And I know Sadna is going to talk about the ethos of the course, the specific course we're looking at today. Um, I do recommend that you come on site at some point. I know it's not always possible for everybody. And the two ways you can do that to kind of see this studio culture in, in practice, we'll say, is, um, is campus tours. We run them every term or we do run postgraduate open days that take place on site. And we're aiming for probably February, March next year, we'll have an on-site one. And the reason we do it this way is so that you have an online open day now for the first deadline, uh, application deadline, and there's a second application deadline. I'll list these at the end, um, which uh, we, we run the on-site open day so that it, it, it coincides with that. So you have two opportunities to engage with us. Um, 
we're very much inspired by our local community uh, that's looking at the Peckham area and London in general. Um, and then we're also dedicated to driving forward positive social change through art and design. Just want to highlight that uh, I think it was four or five years ago, we did a, a large, a really significant redevelopment of the site at Camberwell. Um, Camberwell has been uh, an art and design school for about 120 years. Um, some of the changes we made was to enlarge the canteen space, social spaces, halls of residence has been built on site that wasn't there before. And workshops and creative space, making spaces have all been improved as well. So now as a site, it's kind of got a cohesive feel to it. Just going to give you two slides on the postgraduate community. One of the interesting things about joining um, a postgraduate course in one of the colleges at UAL is that you have that course that you work with. So your your day to day activities with that course. But there's also a virtual and physical postgraduate community that happens across the university. Um, and that includes a whole range of different activities, which you can drive yourself very much as a student on the course as well. We pay postgraduate student ambassadors for each of the colleges to lead this. Um, and that can be anything from creative led tours, uh, curate, curator led tours, uh, to visiting artist studios, design studios, industry spaces, engaging with the research activity happening at UAL. Um, it can be student led activities, not knowledge exchange activities. Um, or just an opportunity to network across the postgraduate community. Um, I recommend following their Instagram. I've given you a list of um, ways of keeping an eye on what they do here on the right. Uh, I recommend the Instagram in particular. Um, and once you join, you you need to have a UL email address, but you have access to, I think it's a bi week every two weeks, uh, they send an email, which is really detailed. And it's not just looking at the community, it's looking at where, what you might want to do next. Uh, funding opportunities, different things that might be of interest to a postgraduate audience. Um, so that's quite a useful thing to have um, that keeps you engaged with the wider community across UAL. Um, looking at student services in general, uh, kind of stepping away from the course, uh, ac the, the academic side of things for a moment, um, there is a, um, a department called Student Services that have disability and dyslexia advisors counsellors, health advisors, chaplaincy. Um, so they're all contained within one department, which you can access before you apply. In, if you want to discuss anything about how we can accommodate you as a student here, if you have specific requirements, um, you can just, there's a simple drop down form you can find on the webpage, fill in your information, your question, um, and they'll get back to you and let you know how they can support you. They recommend that you engage now rather than when you're enrolling because that gives them more time to set things up if things need to be arranged. There's also um, Art Students Union, which I recommend you have a look at, um, which gives you access to a lot of um, sports societies, uh, as well as societies looking at various things from life drawing right through to mountain climbing. Uh, so generally, a whole range of interests are accommodated there. And then the last thing I'd highlight is Arts Thames, which is a way of making money part time. Uh, we pay London living wage and there's a whole range of things. It could be that you're helping at an event uh, with wayfinding, or you could be actually designing. We do hire graphic designers through Arts Temps. It's not just an internal uh, recruitment uh, company anymore. It now brings external work in. So you could be working for an external company as well. So it's a nice opportunity and you can sign up to that when you enroll. Looking at the entry requirements, uh, in general, we require a BA degree or equivalent academic qualification, evidence of um, just sorry, I just wanted to check. Yep, that's fine. I had a pop up evidence of ability in your chosen subject area. Uh, alternative qualifications and experience are taken into consideration. You can use your personal statement to highlight those and to explain to us how they relate to the course and your ambitions within the course. You will be asked to upload a portfolio as well, a mini portfolio. I'll give a little more information about that, and I'm sure Sarnay will cover that in more detail. And we also look at experience, uh, experiences you, you might have had outside of academic study as well that might be relevant to the course. Um, this is an ME level course. So the, the IELTS requirement, just for people who where English is not their first language, is the sec the last paragraph there, the last sentence there. So it's IELTS level five, six point five, sorry, with five point five in reading, writing, listening, and speaking, or an equivalent qualification. We recommend you look at the web pages around that just to make sure if you don't have an IELTS, what else you might be able to use as an equivalent qualification for this. Um, and again, you can ask us if you're if you're not sure. 
Um, the thing to highlight here is that um, some people are, it's not clear cut if they're home EU or international. So do please check on the website, the categorizations, just to make sure where you sit uh, in that. So you know your fee status. Once you know your fee status, there is um, there are different ways of paying for your fees. So you can pay by installments. It's quite structured, so you can check that depending on how long your course is, it can vary. But generally, you have to pay 50% on enrollment or before enrollment. And then there can be an installment plan after that at different points in the course. So that's worth checking as well if that helps. There are funding options. If you've studied with us before, um, now this wouldn't be a short course, it would be a BA or something equivalent to that. You get a 20% discount. Um, it is worth checking the information around that, but that's a rough overview of how that works. Um, there are scholarship opportunities as well, UAL scholarships for home students. Um, at the moment, there's 100 for this year. There's more than there were last year. There's 185 scholarships of £7,000 towards your fees. So it's a fee waiver. There's two different routes to apply. So for everything I mentioned here, the specific requirements for application and there'll be different criteria. So you have to check those and maybe discount the ones that don't apply to you, focus on the ones that do. You do have plenty of time. I mean, the main thing here is to focus on the application for the course. Once you've applied to the course and you're accepted, then you can progress your application for the scholarship. So really the scholarships, it's worth reading about them, knowing about them, knowing the deadlines, but you can't really apply until you have an offer of a place. Same applies here for the international scholarships. Uh, there's 215 at 7,000 pounds fee waivers. Um, and there's two sets of deadlines that's linked to the fact that we have two deadlines for the application in December and in April. Um, and then there's four 50,000 pound scholarships. And this covers your tuition fees, accommodation at one of UAL halls of residence. Um, and it may also contribute towards your living costs. Um, and again, the deadline is listed there as well. There's lots of information about these on the fees and funding pages on UAL's website. You can also apply for um, uh, um, a postgraduate master's loan through the gov.uk website. Um, that's a whole separate application. It's quite detailed, but in general, um, I think this figure here is from last year. It's 12,111, uh, sorry, 12,167 pounds towards your cost of study. And it's at your discretion how you spend that towards your study. The loan is paid directly in three installments to you. Repayment begins once you reach the earning, earnings threshold, thresholds. And we just want to highlight if you have an undergraduate loan, you'll be repaying both, just so you know that in advance. Give you an idea of how much it costs to study. There is a fees and funding calculator on the fees and funding webpage. It's worth going through that, spending some time on that just to get some ideas of costs and how you may be able to uh, cover those. And then just winding up here, the application process, the every course webpage in UAL has an apply section and it gives this uh, section here in much more detail. But in general, it's a 500 word person statement that you apply. Uh, you do this directly on a website. So you uh, create uh, an account on the UAL portal that allows you to upload your person statement. Um, and then once you've done that, there's some initial checks, which then triggers, assuming all those checks are OK, it triggers a request for a mini portfolio, which is a maximum of 30 images. Um, and we link you to a system that allows you to upload those images. And then once that's done, an academic will look at those and then that will trigger a selection of dates for you to choose an interview date, which will take place online. It generally takes place on Teams. Um, um, and that's it. And then you would hear through the UL portal the status of your application at the end. There's two sets of deadlines. And the thing we want to highlight here is that don't worry that if you miss the 13th of December deadline, there will be places available for the 3rd of April deadline. But we recommend when you're ready, apply, get your application in, um, and it's assessed in that cycle. So there's two cycles, 13th of December and the 3rd of April. And as you saw with the scholarships, the scholarships also have deadlines which are either in July or they're in sync with these two deadlines as well. So you have two opportunities uh, for this. And that's it, we'll come back to this slide again, but this is some contact information if you have any questions around any of this. It could be relating to accommodation, fees and funding, immigration, specifics of the course, anything like that, we can help you on this email address here. So that's it for me. I'm gonna hand you over to my colleague, Sadna. Thank you so much, James. Actually, I have a question um, with regards to the scholarship. Um, and we have a process by which 
students previously had to have the acceptance letter. Um, so they've applied for the course, they've been interviewed, they've been accepted, and then that triggers the scholarship process. Does that remain the same for 23-24? As far as I know, that has not changed. Okay, so that's yeah. worth noting. Uh, if anyone's interested in the scholarships, is to make sure that you are, you know, in a timely way meeting the deadlines because you need the acceptance letters from the courses um, in order to um, put your application for scholarship as well. Um, so do you want to attend sharing your screen, Sadna? Yeah. Just make sure it's both. okay. <laughs> right. Okay, so... Um, So I'm just going to go full screen mode. Perfect. Okay, are we good? So yep. I may just after the intro take off my camera so everyone can just see the main slide. So what we're going to do is um, introduce the course. I'm going to do it in two parts. I'm going to tell you first initially about the um, course experience at the start and how to settle into that. And then we're going to segue to Narisha, who will talk about her own experience and maybe very much about the middle part of the course. And then towards the end, uh, we will wrap up with some further student stories because I think it's quite important to know you know, what did students do after the course? What does their career look like? And there's a couple of examples uh, that we have to be able to demonstrate that. So in this presentation, I want to cover the ethos and the identity of the course and followed that by some aspects of the curricula and the learning. And overall, the aim is to help you uh, with this course is, is to help you develop your design practice and ensure that you are kind of ready for the external world. Sorry. I... Okay. So the uh, MA graphic design course at Camberwell, its main theme is about this idea of emergent design and what it's aiming to do is to connect the current social and cultural issues which are emerging in design practice and see how that's resonating with, with changes that are occurring in the outside world. In the course, we're going to provide you with an introduction to debates and methodologies that are at the forefront of contemporary design. And you'll also learn how to challenge and expand this knowledge with your own design practice. At the start of the course, we have these three research themes, which you can see on the screen. And they're there to help you develop the relationship between this idea of the lived experience, the external world, and the dynamic changes that are happening inside of design as well. The themes that we offer are really broad so that every student can find their own way to grow their interests within them. And in particular, what we're also interested in from our international cohort is really about perspectives which maybe even challenge the maybe normative ways of thinking around um, research design and design practice. And that you bring to the course some of your own perspectives either around these themes or around your interests, which would widen the interpretation of design and cultures. So I'm just going to very quickly go through these research themes for you, highlight maybe some key words or some key practices to really just set the tone of what they mean. So the first theme, proximities and encounters, maybe some of the key words here are really about human experience, interaction, um, transitions and encounters. And this really is thinking about interaction uh, from the point of view of the user uh, and that it could be done in playful and participatory ways. So one of the key questions that we ask with this research theme is 
How can design practices work with people? And working with might require sort of strategic ways of looking at design through everyday life and extraordinary lived experience. So it might um, intersect visual language systems as well as ideas of the community. Another angle that you might look at might also be to do with interaction in terms of more cutting edge ideas around materials, technologies, and therefore this idea of working with the phrase that I mentioned might be to cross the ways that we think about human behaviors, but also with other emerging ideas about artificial systems or even things to do with ecologies. And so um, the lecture that's associated with this theme aims to broaden what design practice might be and how this might relate to people. So just to quote one of our lecturers kind of notes from this lecture, quote, your making can offer so much more than a passive artifact that is only interacted with through looking. So one of the prompts that we give you in this research theme is to think about how other senses might be engaged. What other ways of experiencing, feeling, knowing might be involved in, within this work? Moving on then to our second research theme. This is probably more mobilizing studios, probably more about ideas of collaboration or co-creation or networks and communities. And the, uh, it, well, some of the examples that you hear, have here on the slide are both case studies, but also work that we've done ourselves. So the Developing Citizen Designers uh, was an extracurricular project uh, that took place in Paris with international students and is featured in this book here, um, as well as the bottom image as well is to do with working in networks in, in relationship to a conference that was held here at the university called Memories of the Future, whereas the images on the left-hand side uh, relate to case studies from the British Council. So examples of the case studies from the lecture looks at the physical tools and methods for communities and asks these questions that we ask as a group of students and tutors together, what design practices might offer in the aid of struggle? An example like this also requires you to think of traditional uh, printing at different scales and in very dynamic and fleeting time scales. And then the um, next theme, materiality and the post real. We're thinking really here about how do we exist and behave in the world? And a key word that we use here, which you may or may not know, is about ontology. And we use that to kind of examine um, histories as well as our present moment leading into the future. So how do we exist and behave in the world is one way of thinking about also issues of equalities. And equally in our practice, we're thinking about production and making, which returns the world in different shapes. And what we mean by that is that there's a kind of duality between how we behave and how we make design objects and material artifacts and the things that we make in turn influence behaviors. So there's a kind of like figure of eight being established. And as the imagery on the screen really conveys, it could be about the living, it could be about human and data, it's active all around us. And we want to examine, you know, the phenomenons from different perspectives. And so in this context with materiality in the post real, it is vital therefore that we research and consider the sort of ever new realities and materialities of the world. 
how are they constructed, and what are their effects across multiple scales? So what effects do our material making has on the human or even the non-human or at a larger scale, the planet overall? And just kind of to like bring all of those things into thinking about teaching and learning practices. So in this first stage of the course, I've sort of very gently described to you some of our research themes and maybe some of our critical thinking. And this is supported by um, sessions and learning practices um, that's listed on this screen here. So Library of Common Knowledges, that's a peer-led, working with staff, of course, way of thinking about different interpretations of research and practices. So it allows us not to kind of erase anyone's perspective, but really hold them all together. And along with the design library, it's encouraging the students on the course to really collect together lots of different interpretations of design that can be shared across the different groups and individuals. That our lectures as well in our first term um, very quickly goes to sort of seminars where we can unpack some of the ideas and bring our own personal experiences into question. What do we believe in, in relationship to the lectures? So we, we kind of really want to develop the lectures and the program of work so that the students have a lot of input to respond and debate to these ideas. And just to extend this idea of research as well, that we have different ways of researching. And I think it's really proactive and really um, enlightens the students to be able to see research when it's available from other organizations and other studios. So um, a quick mention to the design museum that we have here in London, who quite regularly now showcase the work of up and coming design practitioners through their residency program. And we take the students there to have a look at the work they're making. And we try and encourage students to think that that could be them not, you know, not shortly after their own graduation to be part of a community within something like the Design Museum. So these are some of the strategies that we have. And this image is also from um, an exhibition that we visited, which was showcasing both practice and the research. And some of you may recognize it, but it's from Studio Oliver Ellison. Um, and it was an amazing session where we took the students to see this gigantic wall where he had printed out the research that his company um, or studio puts together and holds in lots of archives. And in this way, then we are able to like combine this idea of critical thinking with field trips and making use of our cultural organizations in London. And I'm just going to very quickly, before I hand over to Narisha, uh, just flick through a couple of slides which relates to our learning environments. And I know that Narisha is going to talk a little bit about them. So some images from our letterpress studio. Material making, so combining graphics and communication design together is quite important, hence our title of our course is both. So we're thinking about graphic language, but we're also thinking about clever, playful strategies for engaging our users in the work. And material making as well. We consider everything within our realms as a product of communication. So it could be 3D objects and you have access to the workshops which allow you to produce um, material making in these different forms. So it could be wood, metal, ceramics, any of those combinations. And now, uh, before I hand over to Narisha, just to remind you of the structure. So, so far I've really talked about the first stage of the course, but just to sort of paint the fuller picture, as you know, we're a 15 month structure and these are the three stages of our course. And in stage three, stage three, we start the final 
um, units of work in July and June, July. And then we have this summer break. And then you return to finish your master's in the autumn term, which is now. And uh, remarkably, that today is the actual final hand in for the master's students. So we're very privileged to have Narisha here because I'm sure she's incredibly busy preparing for her submission this afternoon. And we'll come back to some more if you have questions about the structure. But at this stage, I think what I'll do is stop my screen share and hand over to Narisha. So while she's, yeah, so while she's getting herself ready, just say, um, so Narisha joined us from Nepal. Um, and it's right to say that London was relatively new for you. So you, you literally moved your whole life and your design practice over to join us in London. Isn't that right? Yes. <laughs> and it's been a real pleasure. I just want to say it's been a real pleasure having you as yeah, well. Yeah, it is. It is. And mine as well. <laughs> oh, thank you. So um, I'm going to now mute myself and let Narisha uh, take over. So welcome, Narisha. Thank you. So uh, talking about myself, I'm from Nepal, as Sadna has already told. So uh, I also work as a graphic design designer and illustrator back home. But uh, coming here in URL and extending my work process and my creative like practice was a pleasure and my work like really tries to inform the multidisciplinary experiences and like print designs graphic design like visual designs and I really love to work on the idea around like language of material material sorry material and I'm really interested in like community building and community dri driven projects so uh, and talking about my experience in our program uh, it has been a really like a interesting these whole like 15 months have been my most wild and very interesting like journey so talking about like our, our practical work and uh, critical design thinking and also like explore exploration in our design practice and talking about our like tutors and technicians and all the visitor practitioners who come to our program and uh, give their like experiences their like knowledge of how they have been in the industries for like so many years they they teaches us all their experiences which is very good for the students to learn and uh, talking about like our gamma well workshops it's it's great because the te technicians that we have are very helpful they help us like all the time so whenever we are in crisis or whenever we have like we're running around and like asking them for help they will always help us so that is like great so and uh talking about my Marisha, uh, now sorry, I'm to going to, you. sorry um could you make your screen full screen i think it is oh sorry you're okay, okay. perfect Okay. Uh, so talking about my work process, uh, it's more about like detailed research and critical thinking of my practice and about the topic which I'm uh, really trying to approach. And uh, then I will be talking about the studio practice, which is like visual language uh, where I work on. And then the self-reflection part uh, which is more about like portfolios and our research folders, like how I learned from these, like all practices from our tutors, our tutorials and like different things. 
uh, that I researched on like different because we have a great library uh, access, which is great because uh, the resources are very good, uh, which really helped me in these like 15 months uh, to approach my design practice, which really uh, opened my mind um, because back home, uh, I really didn't got chance to do that. And um, I'm really pleased to have that part right now. So uh, going through my Uni2 project, I would like to say that it was in the theme of like developing a design framework in critical and practical like way. So in this Uni2 project, I, um, as you can see, there is like, uh, the topic is remembering the traces, like timeless beauty of Ranjana Lipi. So I'm from Nevar community, uh, which is a small, um, community from Kathmandu Valley. Uh, so I took one of the tangible, like intangible heritage, which is like uh, the spoken language, which is a uh, written script, but uh, which is called like Ranjana Lipi. And uh, I work around that, uh, that theme because um, as our script and language is going to extinct, so uh, I was more about like pre talking about like preservation and how I'm going to work around like critically working around with the communities and uh, the cultures and traditions that we have and how I'm going to uh, preserve that or for the future generations. That was my main purpose for this project. So um, talking about myself, uh, I, as a Newar, I know how to speak my language, but the thing was, I didn't know how to uh, re read and write it. So the theme developed around that. And then I researched and most of the youngsters and as well as our uh, old generation people didn't know how to read that language. And as well as like, they don't know how to write it. So. Uh, it's a crisis and uh, it developed from all the research and um, the theories around that. So I attempt, attempted to revive it through my exploration and my um, self-driven practices. So going through that, um, there are like different uh, outputs from my Uni2 project. So one of the experiments that I did was in publication. Uh, that was a concertina book. So um, while doing the concertina book, why I chose this was because uh, the scripts and the language from the, the inscriptions, I would say, from the uh, past generations were uh, written in a concertina way. So um, I took that idea and I tried to incorporate in my design practice. So, so that is the way how I developed this concertino book uh, with the feel and the texture of um, the leather binding and everything. So with the embossing, uh, so that I could um, ex experiment in the language of materia materiality. So uh, these is, uh, this is another like piece of my experiment from unit two. Uh, this is also a publication. And the other one is my poster designs that I did for uh, this project. So these are more examples of my poster designs. And then uh, I really like to like play with the um, different like techniques. So uh, I have experimented in like screen printing, and uh, the digital mediums as well. So this is one of the example of my screen printing. And another thing is I really, uh, what I loved about my Uni2 project is uh, I've, it really pushed me into my, like from my boundaries, which is like, I really didn't know how to make a video or something, but I tried it. And uh, this was my first attempt. But as I went through my unit two, I really developed my uh, interest and my 
uh, project like it it was uh, it was a process of learning at the same time uh getting what i wasn't able to do but at the same time it was a great like learning process so i really love you to uh my project i'd say so uh these are some of the videos that i took so uh these are more examples of like calligraphy writing of ranjana lipi like learning uh as well as like how i was uh, creating a video through uh the voice overs in my own language and then uh playing with like clips like small like uh moving images and then using it to explore the idea around like preservation and uh ex like extensive uh exploration so these are some more examples of how i made like my project so uh the uh, another thing that i did in my unit 2 was the workshop and participation and uh this uh really came off well as um i also tried to uh try to connect with the international like my colleagues from my uh class so they also try to write their like write their like uh names in my like language like script i'd say so they were really interested and uh the main purpose of doing this was like having a culture like cross culture dialogue between like all the students and my friends and the right hand side picture is from the people of my community who are living here in london so uh, i try to contact some of the people and i try to like make a workshop around that so uh these are some more examples so um this uh this is like my own practice from unit 2 because i as i have told earlier that i didn't knew how to write this language so there was like lots of practice and lots of exploration around that uh and i really built built my like strong calligraphy technique in while i was learning and writing the script so uh my design practice in unit 2 was that so thank you if you have any questions you can ask thank you so much narisha um we'll see if questions come in are they able to write them into the um chat james yeah they come through to my chat here so i can okay. see them So what I would recommend uh people who are listening just have a little, let if you want to let that information absorb have a think about what you might want to ask Narisha or even myself um is you have the advantage of hearing the student perspective and whilst you're thinking about those questions I'm going to quickly return to um the completing the narrative of the course and that will give people a time to piece these bits of information together so i'm going to continue with the screen share and come back to this slide bear with me okay so what we've heard so far was the description of the beginning of the course with the research themes and the types of challenging conversations and ideas that we'd like to hold around it Narisha has shown you her own work uh, around the second stage of the course and I think what's really noticeable about the second stage as she describes it it's it's a stage of exploring your very personal ideas without necessarily knowing everything that you're going to do it's quite organic it unfolds and the staff are here to just check that there's a balance between the criticality and then this kind of joyful way of exploring making and design in that way so that describes stage 2 
And then stage three, I think it's important to, to take a moment to describe that because uh, we're trying to put some emphasis on careers and employability in a way that isn't necessarily about working with companies, but really it's about working with people, organizations, stakeholders, all the necessary things that are very much part and parcel of being a designer. So before I get into that, just to recap, stage one is about exploring your design thinking and ideas. Stage two is about developing your own personal design project and a critical and practical framework around it. And stage three is this, is this concentrated way of thinking about your interactions with audiences and stakeholders. And so what I'm going to do is just by the means of showing you a couple of um, students really talk about how we make this bridge between the final stage of the course and then life afterwards. So I'll come back to the staff team slide. So the images that you have on the screen here on the left hand side is about our final show taken a, um, some years ago. And we have this idea of having a show in different guises each year. And on the right hand side is the final stage project work, which is from three different people. Um, one is about working with communities around food systems. And that was based in rural India. And then the image at the bottom, that's about working with uh, communities, trying to um, playfully develop this notion of uh, learning in school, school environments and breaking some norms there. And that took place in China. So I'm gonna come back to the alumnus we have from, uh, she was from India. Her name's Niraja Drog. And she was interested in speculative design, food systems for the future. And what she did for her final stage project was really get to work with working with communities outside and outside of the college. As Narisha was describing, this kind of way of just beginning to reach out to people that you think are connected with your project is really key in being able to drive this idea of careers and employability. Because what you're doing there is building that process of interaction into your work. And so this student that uh, whose work you see on screen was doing things in different layers for her project. What she was doing was uh, working and interviewing with uh, communities in rural India. And just to give you a bit of context, this was in the pandemic era. So we made the most of what happens when we were outside of the university. And what she's doing there is gathering a lot of knowledge about how does the rural community respond to food systems when they are the, they're the ones that are dealing with the process literally from ground upwards. And then at the same time, what she was doing in her project was accessing data and making a lot of visualizations about food systems as they develop towards the future. And this is what I mean about a layered project, but also it starts to develop a very, very strong professional profile because what she's doing is this process of accessing expert information, working with organizations, and these are key skills that designers need in terms of their um, transition as they move from coursework to their professional lives. So what she was doing was in the, in the daytime, working with the local community and, and farmers and uh, whoever holds the information on food systems. And then remarkably, this is quite remarkable really for a student to do this. At night, she was also holding online seminars with anybody who was interested around the world, interested in this notion of food cultures and food systems from many different perspectives. And uh, it was um, you know, amazing that she was able to hold these. And she had correspondence from designers in the Netherlands, as well as visitors to her seminars from MIT. Um, what she, and it was through that experience that she met one of her future employers. 
um, was able to produce a publication which was called The Common Table. So I feel this is a really fantastic example of how we take a project at the end of the course and we start to involve ourselves in cultures, communities outside of the university. And this is then the um, springboard in terms of going forward. Perhaps a more traditional way of looking at the course as it comes to the close and then this moving into a career path. We had one student who had traditional graphic design practice at bachelor's level. And when he came to the MA, um, he had this kind of fantastic spirit to try completely new practices in his works. And what he was able to, sorry, and what he was able to make in his practice was um, this interactive story machine, which he had never done before. He'd never done three-dimensional work. He'd never done interaction design. And the course is supportive in that way, that we don't expect you to be experts, but the willingness to expand your practices and skills is kind of what we're here for. After the course, he went on to set up his own studio, which is called Kind Studio, and that URL should be still be correct. So please have a look at his work and you get an idea of then maybe the combinations of core graphic design skills, which he developed from his BA through the MA and onwards, as well as then being having, having the ability to be more interdisciplinary, so maybe more agile, working with different partners um, in his commercial practice. And then finally, uh, one um, student that we had who was from Russia, and she was, again, interested in kind of interdisciplinary practices, and really, again, another student who pushed herself to do lots of things in her final project, which included, you know, this idea of performance, uh, which would take place in this touring uh, play, as well as doing scene design as well. And this way of thinking about graphic communication design through graphic, spatial, audio, visual was very much key in, in terms of her moving forward and getting a graphic design position at the Natural History Museum here in London. Um, and then just finally one student that we had who had a very keen interest in looking at healthcare and the body as the topic of her work. And she went on to join the Helen Hamlin Research Center at the Royal College of Art. Um, so these are just some of the, some of the ways that students can start to develop their career profile and for you to therefore understand the journey through the course, where does it take them onwards um, and how does their final project work help in that way? I think at this stage, I'm going to stop. Um, I just wanted maybe to just very quickly show the staff team in this slide here, so that you know that we are a, a very combined, multi-skilled group of people. You can read the details here um, and different backgrounds, different ages, different research practices going on as well. Um, I'm going to stop there, James. So I'm going to do a stop my screen share and hand over back to you. Thanks, Adnan. Just going to get um, a slide up with some um, contact information just so people have it. I'll just, I'll just leave that up for a few minutes. That's our Instagram handle. Well, it's all of our social media uh, channels, but um, I strongly recommend you follow Instagram. The upcoming shows will cover there uh, quite a bit as well. Um, and then that email address, as I mentioned before, definitely use that for anything. Um, our team probably can answer everything, but we'll make sure we find the person who can and get you a response. Um, Nourisha, do you want to come back in? Because there's a question specifically asking you something. 